think we are going to begin. Um, welcome back, everybody. This is the final session, session number four of the day. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, I, I know some of you, but I don't know a lot of you. So for those of you who do not know me, my name is Ivana Grakalik and uh, I'm a program officer in Division of Neuroscience and Behavior at uh, NHAAA. And uh, I will be a moderator for this final session of the day. So we had a very fruitful discussion uh, in our last session, which focused on um, um, chronic pain and OUD. And uh, in this session, we are going to extend it to some other comorbid disorders. And specifically, we are going to talk about uh, chronic pain and comorbid, comorbid uh, AUD, anxiety, and depression. Uh, we are going to have three speakers. Um, so please keep it uh, 15 minutes per presentation. Um, and just as in the previous sessions, uh, we will take clarifying questions only after each presentation and uh, we'll save the general discussion questions for the panel discussion. So also please type your questions in the chat box um, and uh, please indicate who the questions uh, is, um, <clears throat> who are you referring the questions to uh, and also raise your hand to contribute to a response. So uh, with that, uh, I'm going to introduce our first speaker. Uh, it's Katie Witkowitz. Katie, are you ready? Yep. Okay, the floor is all yours. Okay, great. Well, thank you again for organizing and for the invitation. I'm really excited to be here to talk about chronic pain and alcohol use disorder. And also we'll touch on opioid use disorder and, and kind of the confluence of these three uh, comorbid chronic conditions. Oh, oh, right, next slide. I started to advance myself. Uh, so really quickly, this research is supported by NIAAA and NIDA. And I especially want to acknowledge my collaborator, Dr. Kevin Vowles, who really inspired uh, or was kind of part of the collaboration. I was an alcohol and drug researcher and Kevin was a chronic pain researcher. And when we were both at University of New Mexico, we kind of came together and joined forces in this work. Oh, next slide. So we've been talking a lot about opioid use disorder, but actually alcohol is a, a much bigger cause of morbidity and preventable mortality in the United States. Uh, if we compare alcohol deaths, a very outdated number of 2010, uh, that was the last time we cared enough to actually count the number of deaths related to alcohol. We were at 88,000, I, I guarantee you it's far more now. Uh, and opioid deaths in 2018 is, is around 47,000. Uh, and if we look at any of the recent national surveys, we see that alcohol use disorder uh, far um, exceeds opioid use disorder in prevalence as well as treatment seeking. And of course, these are not mutually exclusive categories. A lot of individuals have both OUD and AUD. Um, and my point is not to minimize opioid use disorder deaths or opioid use disorder mortality or treatment seeking, uh, but only to make the point that alcohol use disorder is a major killer in the US and something that we should not ignore. Next slide, please. And of course, alcohol has long been used as an analgesic. Uh, and so many people have learned about uh, using alcohol to self-medicate for pain. And in fact, um, this very old bottle of Foley's Pain Relief contained 50% alcohol. Uh, and was specifically a, a targeting pain relief. And so many people um, historically have used alcohol uh, as an analgesic. Uh, next slide, please. And this wonderful article uh, from 2012, it's an older article now, but really did a wonderful job of talking about the inherent links between alcohol use, negative affect, and pain and went so far as to call alcohol dependence a chronic pain disorder. And this came out of the uh, NIAAA intramural lab, uh, as well as at the time Scripps, when, when Dr. Kube was at Scripps. And really highlighting uh, the various cycles of alcohol use and alcohol use disorder and how various neural substrates um, 
of both alcohol use and negative affect and pain are, are inherently linked and, and related. And put a, a much simpler way uh, by my favorite uh, car, uh, my favorite television show is Family Guy. So if we can just advance to the next graphic, uh, Peter Griffin is saying, come on, let's drink till we can't feel feelings anymore. And that's an actual line from the show. Uh, certainly uh, patients uh, come to learn, individuals come to learn that alcohol can help reduce negative affect and can help reduce pain and actually it's quite effective in the moment. Uh, so if we can go to the next slide, please. So this is a more elegant way of saying that and this is from uh, Dr. Eagley's uh, 2012 paper showing the intersection of pain circuitry, reward circuitry, uh, and, and kind of the role of alcohol and negative emotional states in that circuitry along with the cycles of the cycle of addiction. And so at, at the three stages of addiction, we have uh, varying roles that, that pain can play in both analgesia, but then hyperalgesia. And so this is very concerning because people are using alcohol to manage pain and then develop even greater pain responses. Uh, next slide, please. We recently updated that review. Uh, uh, Scott Edwards led this. This was actually a, a symposium that we did on alcohol and pain at the ISBRA meeting. And we basically provided an updated review of both preclinical and clinical findings in the alcohol and pain field. And, and basically what we find is this, this not too surprising um, relationship where acute pain increases urges to drink and alcohol self-administration, and that's both in rodent and human models. Uh, and that use of alcohol to uh, treat acute pain increases hypersensitivity to pain. And so what we see in the clinic is that many patients with chronic pain use alcohol and have alcohol use disorder, and many patients with alcohol use disorder uh, have pain. And, and a lot of the pain actually is perpetuated by alcohol. So uh, many gastrointestinal uh, concern, pancreatitis, for example, is very common in patients with alcohol use disorder and it's very painful. Uh, also liver pain is very common and just general uh, neuropathy, diabetes is very common. So uh, there's kind of this very uh, tragic loop of, of people using alcohol to treat pain and then that creating both hypersensitivity to pain, but also greater pain conditions. Next slide, please. We also have done some work showing that pain actually makes alcohol treatment outcomes worse. So pain increases risk of heavy drinking relapse following alcohol treatment. So the blue line is individuals who were um, one standard deviation below the mean on pain scores and the black line is one standard deviation above the mean. And we can see that survival suggests that those who were above the mean on pain scores had quicker time to their first heavy drinking day following treatment. And the next slide, please. And then among those, uh, not just relapse to drinking, but also drinking outcomes more generally, we can see pretty much a dose response where people who have higher pain are reporting more drinking uh, in the months and up to a year following treatment. And we also, I, I don't have it here, but um, just to lead into the next talk, we, we find that pain is associated with heavier drinking and that is mediated by negative affect. So it's really negative affect mediated pain. People are experiencing pain, they don't feel good, they don't want that pain, they experience um, a lot of depression and anxiety and anger and then, um, uh, and then proceed to drink and drink heavier. Next slide, please. So moving um, now into kind of the question of opioid use, we've also found that alcohol use is associated with a two and a half times increase in the rate of misusing opioid medications to relieve pain. So this is using data from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, and the left pie chart is people with no binge drinking in the past 30 days, and that pie chart is bigger because it's a bigger percent of the, the population. And about 2.9% of individuals with no binge drinking uh, reported their last, their last pain reliever use or misuse in the, in the NSDUH survey language was to relieve pain. 
And then if we look at people with binge drinking in the past 30 days, which is about a third of the sample in, in the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, we see that 6.7% report misusing last pain reliever to relieve pain. So more, more than a two times increase in people using and misusing, according to the NSDUH language, um, pain relievers to relieve pain. Next slide, please. And so um, not surprisingly, we also find that opioid use uniquely increases risk of heavy drinking relapse following alcohol treatment. So opioid use also confers uh, worse drinking outcomes um, for those in alcohol treatment. And this is a particularly surprising finding for this particular study because they excluded any individuals with opioid use disorder from this study. So um, it was individuals who were using opioids and, and the question was again asked around opioid misuse. Um, and that predicted quicker time to first heavy drinking day following treatment. Next slide, please. So among a, a chronic pain sample, um, and this is moving into work that was led by uh, Dr. Kevin Valls, we found that chronic pain patients who were prescribed opioids um, report uh, misuse, and I'm gonna use that term in quotes because of, of the stigma associated with that word, but misuse here was defined by exceeding uh, risk scores for misuse on the COM, the, uh, which measures opioid misuse risk, and then on the, uh, the audit. And what we found was that individuals um, who were chronic pain patients, about a third um, had no aberrant use of opioids or alcohol, another third had aberrant use of opioids only, and then 26% had aberrant use of opioids and alcohol. Um, only 3% actually had aberrant use of just alcohol. And so interestingly, in this chronic pain sample, it seems that patients are kind of using opioids in a way that is risky or using opioids and alcohol in a way that is risky, but not really referring to just alcohol. Um, if they're using alcohol in a risky way, it's all they're using opioids in a risky way as well. Next slide, please. And, you know, the, the issue, and I, this goes back to actually the, the Dr. Farrar's talk at the beginning of the day of um, that we can't manipulate a person's, or we can manipulate a person's reaction and perception to pain. And what we found, again, using data from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, is that the majority of people who are misusing, again, using their language, prescription opioids are doing so for pain relief. And this is regardless of AUD diagnosis. There was some belief in the field that maybe people with AUD were not using opioids for, for pain relief, but that is not the case. The majority of individuals, regardless of AUD diagnosis, are reporting that they last misused their prescription opioid for pain relief. And, and this brings up a really important question um, and, and something that I feel really passionately about is, is around kind of the function. Of, of medications and of alcohol in people's lives and having compassion for the fact that, that there is a real desire to, to mitigate and provide some pain relief. Next slide, please. And so what can be done? And, and you know, this really gets at the heart of, of that comment that we can manipulate a person's reaction and perception to pain. We cannot eliminate pain, right? We know that. That would be, I don't want to live in a world where I do not experience pain. Pain is important. And so what we can do, though, is, is change patients' reactions to pain. And I, and I don't, I, I'm a psychologist, and so of course I'm going to say this, but I don't think pills are the way out of this mess, um, <laughs> honestly. I think uh, behavioral interventions are key. And this gets back to the question of, can we manipulate um, a person's reaction to pain and help people live with pain? And the answer is yes, we can. And so some of the promising interventions um, are mindfulness-based interventions as well as acceptance and commitment therapy. We've actually combined these into a, a, joint, intervention, a joint intervention that combines mindfulness-based relapse prevention for opioid use disorder and acceptance and commitment therapy for chronic pain. We've tested this in a, in a small, very small trial and we um, hopefully will receive transition funding to conduct a larger trial to look at whether this works in a, in a larger sample, but this, this acceptance and commitment therapy and mindfulness intervention both reduced opioid misuse on the calm as well as reduced pain interference. So it got people in the business of living their lives even in the context of pain. 
uh, we did not find it had effects on pain intensity, which is exactly what we want. We want people to be able to actually ex continue to experience pain, but not have pain get in the way of their life and not be using their opioids as a way to manage pain uh, ineffectively. Um, other promising interventions are, of course, we've already heard about this from, from Dr. Garland, is mindfulness-oriented recovery enhancement. Uh, he's worked in alcohol as well as um, alcohol and opioids, and I think, I think these mindfulness-based interventions, acceptance-based interventions, hold a lot of promise for, for dealing with the comorbidity of alcohol, opioids, and pain. Next slide, please. And there's also um, potential pharmacotherapy interventions, and we reviewed a lot of these in this, this recent review paper that I'm happy to, to share and disseminate. But there's some evidence um, from uh, Leandro Vendrascolo on glutocorticoid receptor antagonism um, for alcohol seeking, and there's also some evidence of glutocorticoid receptor antagonism in, in neuropathic pain in a mouse model. Um, obviously, Vivitrol is, is a natural choice. Um, it, it hasn't been tested in this way, but Vivitrol is approved for alcohol use disorder. It's also approved for opioid use disorder. Of course, as we learned um, earlier in Dr. Anderson's talk, is that we don't know that it doesn't provide pain relieving properties, but potentially uh, Vivitrol paired with a psychosocial intervention, such as a mindfulness based intervention for or an acceptance and commitment therapy based intervention for targeting pain could be a great. Um, synergistic combination. Uh, there is work on cannabinoid receptors, um, and so that's a possibility. And then I will mention gabapentin um, that came up earlier is, is kind of a, a potential treatment for pain and is, or not potential treatment, but it's widely used for pain, for neuropathic pain, and it's also been used in the treatment of alcohol use disorder. Uh, next slide, please. So what needs to be done? I, I think, first of all, the basic science, and we, we talk a lot about this in that recent review, the clinical relevance of many traditional animal models of pain and excessive alcohol consumption needs some work to be more relevant. Uh, and there's some recent papers that I included here that talk about the different animal models to assess pain um, and the different animal models for excessive alcohol consumption. And, and so a lot of work needs to be done there. I think it, what's most important and what would be the best outcome of, the, of these meetings would be to really think through exclusions in studies. What we find is that most chronic pain studies exclude people with alcohol use disorder or opioid use disorder. Most human lab studies of pain exclude heavy drinkers or individuals on opioids. So we're basically doing a bunch of science where we're not learning anything about the people we need to learn about. Um, some perfect examples of this are the POTS study, the CTN-30 prescription opioid addiction study. They excluded people with alcohol use disorder and other substance use disorders, uh, as well as the XBOT study also did that. So we, I think we really need to think about in the implications of our exclusions that reduce generalizability. Next slide. And thank you. Thank you, Katie. Are there any clarifying questions for Katie? Up, oh, up, oh, there is something. Okay, so there is a question. Ah, yes, no, that's a great question. The question is about the calm and whether we removed the affect items. Um, that actually just came up in our DSMV about the new trial, and we haven't done those analyses yet, but I will definitely um, forward them to you uh, if we find that it's actually changing the affective items specifically. Thanks, great question. I, I can actually answer that because um, I helped develop the calm. So one, there's some papers out there that if, if you, you can use a cutoff of nine versus 13. So if you use a cutoff of 13, then that tends to suppress the effect of the affective items on the comm. Um, Cause that's one of the things we found the original scoring was like nine or above is associated with high misuse. So that, that's one quick and dirty way to do it with the data you have, which is, and uh, Jane Liebschitz has a paper on that, I believe. Um, okay, so, so just keep that in mind. Yeah, it looks like um, we did use nine of, and or above in the study with um, above, um, or the study that looked at risk. But in our, our clinical trial, it was we used continuous COM scores. So I think it will be important to look at, um, look at that. 
Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's move on to our next speaker. Uh, it's an, our next speaker is Dr. AJ Wasan. Are you ready? Sure, sure. Okay. Can you hear me okay? Yes. yes, thank you. Great. So I'm at the uh, University of Pittsburgh. And uh, next slide, please. So I'm going to cover a, a variety of things, but um, on these slides, I'll really do an overview more than anything else. Uh, since it is a short talk and I you know, won't be able to go into all the details, but um, there's a lot of details on the slides. Of course, they'll be available to all of us at the end of the workshop. Uh, next slide. So one thing we talked about negative affect a lot and, and so much of, uh, and, and some of the ways, some of what I'm talking about has already been covered. Um, so I can at least uh, definitely stay under 15 minutes, but um, in other ways, it's nice to uh, have the prelude and, and the wonderful references to many things I was going to talk about. So. So first is when uh, we talk about affect, um, really referring to the psychiatric kind of approach to affect, which is really the sum total of our thoughts, emotions, and behavior, and how they interact. Um, if you're a cognitive neuroscientist, you might just think of affect as emotion. Um, so just keep that uh, in mind. And we all know what pain catastrophizing is, and that's an example actually of a negative affective cognitive construct that's specific to pain. And so one thing to look at is when you to see that green arrow into that box is that we know, for instance, that some of these specific uh, constructs such as pain catastrophizing, high levels are associated with increased pain and depression and, and worse functioning. Um, but there's also this combined effect. So if you look at anxiety and depression by themselves, they're also associated with higher pain and worse function. Uh, but most of the people that have, say, high pain catastrophizing also tend to have significant depression and anxiety. So that's what negative affect is. It's this cluster of actually of different, um, you know, uh, thoughts, emotions, and behaviors that are maladaptive. Um, and when you look at the combined effect, you actually see much greater effects overall on uh, pain and function. And, and of course, that's how our patients present. They don't just present with poor pain self-efficacy, right? They pain, present with a cluster of a whole a bunch of uh, mental health disturbances, uh, particularly if, if those, those are at high levels. Uh, next slide. So this is another uh, way of expressing the same thing. It's this idea by divide. One way of thinking about all these different psychological constructs related to pain is you can think of DSM-based uh, sort of diagnoses like major depression and generalized anxiety disorder. Then you can think of all of the more pain-specific related psychological symptoms, such as catastrophizing or poor pain self-efficacy or, or uh, pain-related anger. And the correlations between all these constructs is very high. It's between 0.6 and 0.7 in many, many studies. And so it's really, what I'm talking about negative affect is this combined overlap between um, these constructs. Uh, next slide. And uh, these negative affective disorders are very common, um, where, whether you go from the general population all the way up to uh, pain clinics. Uh, for instance, you see in pain clinics between 50 and 80% of patients have a, a major psychiatric disorder defined by DSM criteria. And most of that is major depression followed by anxiety disorders and then adjustment disorders. Next slide. And this gives rise to something that uh, has been discussed previously in the morning, you know, the emotional pain. And, and another term for that is the affective component of pain. Um, and these, these are the sense of unpleasantness of pain, the suffering associated with pain, the inability to tolerate pain, the sense that pain is just overwhelming and someone can't deal with it. All of that is, is affective pain processing. And that's one mechanism by which um, negative affective disorders increase the perception of pain. Next slide. And um, it's, it's even, I, this are some tips I give to any physicians who are treating pain is that, you know, how can you recognize it? How can you get a sense that there may be a negative affective problem? They tend to be patients with pain complaints that seem far out of proportion to uh, what their anatomical pathology might explain or might contribute. They tend to have little variability in pain. They tend to respond poorly to medications or procedures. And I'll show you some data on that as we go on. Next slide. And usually the, these patients who have chronic pain and uh, significant negative affective disorder, they usually have a, a physical basis for their pain. They usually have some structural pathology and that's been pretty well studied. Um, and that the negative affective disorder acts as an amplifier uh, to that pain. Um, next slide. And most of these patients actually develop that negative affective disorder after uh, pain began. 
Uh, and of course, you know, what's, uh, what's recognized, we've talked about this many times, is really treatment of both sides of that coin, the negative affect and the pain at the same time. And of course, the OUD, and I'll talk a little bit about that, uh, is ideal. And so I'm going to next talk about several studies that our group has done uh, over the years in this issue. And the way we've defined negative affect is really the combination of high depression and high anxiety symptoms. And that seems to capture the vast majority of the variance amongst all these different constructs because that group with high depression and high anxiety symptoms also very likely has, and we, we track pain catastrophizing. The, again, the correlations are very high, 0.6 to 0.8, um, showing that those patients also tend to very high pain catastrophizing and poor pain self-efficacy. Um, so keep that in mind. Uh, next slide. So I don't want to forget positive affect. That's uh, something that was mentioned as well. So it is possible to have both negative and positive affect at the same time. So I'll give you an example is that uh, if you have an NIH grant that was rejected, you can feel sad, but you can feel optimistic that your science will prevail someday. So um, that's an example. And positive affect can actually have independent um, effects on pain as well. Uh, so just, just keep that in mind. Next slide. So this is a, a, a variety of a slide that actually John Ferrara presented, kind of showing that there's many areas in the brain that process pain and mood simultaneously. Uh, many of these areas are referred to as the medial pain system, um, and these include uh, some of these areas here that are the bluish um, and purple, so prefrontal cortex, anterior cingulate cortex, and the insula, just below in red, that little red oval. Um, and those are really key areas uh, that are at this interface uh, between pain and negative affect. Uh, next slide. And this gives rise to an important concept uh, that's coined by Karen Davis at University of Toronto, no, as the brain is a dynamic connectome. So if you look on the right uh, at the bottom with those different red boxes, the idea is that there can be uh, disrupted or dysfunctional processing or, or, or function of each of these brain areas and also a dysfunction in how those brain areas interact. And that actually can be one of the factors that amplifies and perpetuates pain in the face of negative affect. Uh, next slide. Okay, I think we'll skip this one. Uh, can I get the next slide? So this is one of my favorite studies. This is done by uh, Rob Edwards and uh, Chantal Berna. And what they did is they, they took patients, these were healthy normal people with no pain and no affect problems, and they gave them a heat pain to their arm, and they got pain responses as you would typically expect, and areas of, in the brain that process pain uh, lit up, and that's on that top uh, panel there, and the blue it represents that there are areas of deactivation, all what you commonly ex expect. Then those same people, they had them, uh, they induced a negative mood. So you can do this. You can make people feel sad temporarily. So they literally would read them statements like, you're a loser, no one likes you, your mother you know, wants to disown you, and people would report feeling sad. And then, um, and that's at the bottom here, they actually did report a worsening mood. And then they gave them the same temperature of heat to their forearm, and they reported uh, greater pain unpleasantness, worse pain overall, greater pain catastrophizing. And you could see um, some of those effects in their brain. You can see greater activation in these areas of process pain and mood together. So it's a nice little example of how these interact and how uh, mood states can directly amplify pain perception. Next slide. So another important area are, are glial cells. We all know that those are ubiquitous cells in the central nervous system and uh, really are important markers of neuroinflammation and a whole variety of neurological diseases. Uh, next slide. And one of the studies we did is we looked at glial cell activity in the brain using simultaneous PET and fMRI scanning. Um, and this is 10 low back pain patients uh, with matched controls. And uh, real, there, in red, you see that center area there at the top, you know, that's the thalamus lighting up uh, more so to an extent uh, than the matched controls, um, really indicating that there's some degree of glial cell activation going on in patients with chronic pain versus uh, healthy controls. Next slide. Then we took this further, and in a separate sample, uh, we recruited 25 patients with uh, low back pain, and we did the same uh, glial cell activation uh, study. It was simultaneous PET and fMRI, and uh, we also tracked levels of depression, and we had a range of depression symptoms from mild, moderate to severe, and we focused on this uh, affective loop, the prefrontal cortex, insula, and ACC, and what you see in green on the right is that um, in the, when the patients who are having more depression symptoms, as measured by the Beck Depression Inventory, they had greater activation of their glial cells in these areas of the ACC, insula, and prefrontal cortex. 
So again, that illustrates that there is a substrate here that is common to both conditions. Um, and as we also know, some of these areas are also common to um, substance use disorders and are really involved in substance use disorders. Uh, we haven't talked about the nucleus accumbens, but that's really a critical area, again, actually for all, where all three conditions intersect. And there's been studies showing that there's disruption of function in the nucleus accumbens and all three of these disorders. Uh, next slide, please. So I'll shift now to some uh, clinical studies that we've done and others have done uh, on negative affect and pain responses. So this is a study of 60 low back pain patients with either low, moderate, or high levels of negative affect. And it was a double-blind placebo crossover study where we gave them five milligrams of IV morphine on average and observed them for three or four hours, or, or we gave them placebo. Um, and it was randomized so they would come back a week later for, and get the other treatment they hadn't gotten the first time. And really the blue bars are what to pay attention to, which is that the high negative affect group really has substantially less analgesia overall over that uh, observation time, pain, time frame, uh, approximately 40% less uh, analgesia. Uh, next slide. Um, we then extended this study and in a separate cohort, cohort of 55 patients with either high or low negative affect we, uh, who are not on opioids at baseline. We prescribed them opioids for, for uh, five months and the prescriber was blinded, didn't know what group the patients were in. And we tracked their pain daily. And you can see on the right um, that the green is uh, the low negative affect group having 38% uh, pain improvement on average, that was sustained. And then the bottom is the, the blue is, a, is the high negative affect group, it only had 90% uh, change in pain on average over the uh, six month time frame. Um, and they also had different rates of misuse. So the uh, high negative affect group had 38% rate of misuse and the low negative affect group had only 8% rate of misuse. And this was determined by uh, something we call the drug misuse index, which I can talk more about in the other slides, uh, which uh, triangulates urine drug screen results, provider assessment and a uh, patient self-report using uh, the COM, you know, for, for instance. And um, we've also kind of shown and written about how this term opioid misuse, which is mainly the main behavior is actually overtaking opioids by taking too many in a day, you know, taking more than what you're prescribed, and that the different misuse behaviors uh, really map onto a diagnosis of a mild OUD uh, criteria. So uh, next slide, please. So um, we've also kind of done the similar thing with different uh, nerve blocks. This is for uh, facet blocks uh, in the spine uh, for lumbar arthritis. Uh, next slide. And we've looked as well at negative affect and I'm, I'm going fairly quick because I want to get to our craving slides um, and really finding that those with higher level ne negative affect really had a much poor response at one month follow-up to the block than those with low negative affect and very similar findings have been shown for spine surgery and epidural steroid injections um, but not for acupuncture so it's not as if negative affect is this negative predictor for everything it's just uh, certain conditions that we've studied we've seen that um, relationship next slide and we also began looking at uh, whether negative affect or a history of depression anxiety disorders uh, predicts misuse, because um, this, this goes back to 2007 when we started looking at these things. And this was actually in one of the multi-site studies to validate the COM. Uh, next slide. And uh, we tracked, again, the same issue of abnormalities during drug screens, provider assessment, and patient, ass and patient report. And first we called this the aberrant drug index that's the, in the oval there and, and we later changed the name to the uh, drug misuse index. And really the rate of misuse was twice as much in the high uh, negative affect group, that's the 52%. Uh, next slide. And so we also began looking at craving and this was before DSM-5, so before it uh, was officially part of the uh, criteria for OUD, uh, we uh, began noticing that patients who reported more craving uh, tended to have higher negative affect and they tended to misuse their opioids. Uh, next slide. And so, and this was in a trial in 60 patients, uh, which was a randomized trial to improve opioid misuse in patients with chronic pain prescribed opioids. Uh, we looked at several factors and they had over two weeks every day, they did uh, a diary at home. And we looked at how strong was the urge to take more opioids? Um, how much did mood or anxiety affect those urges? How preoccupied were they about the next dose? how much do they crave the medication? And then we also uh, had them rate their average pain and their pain right now. Next slide. And what we found is these components of craving hung together very well, which suggested one single underlying con 
construct. They were the correlations were between you know, 0.6 to 0.8 between mood, urge, preoccupation, and craving. And just like it's been said several times today, the correlations of pain were very low. You have approximately 0.1 correlation between craving and pain. And of course, craving is so important, and, and we've talked about that many times today. Uh, next slide. So then we follow this result up. Um, like I said, at this point, we had significant data that negative affect was a predictor of opioid misuse. And we wanted to see if craving was a mediator of this relationship. So this was a different randomized trial to improve opioid misuse in patients with pain. Um, and we were able to look at changes in negative affect, changes in opioid misuse, and changes in craving over time. And indeed, we found that craving was a partial mediator. Um, so this really helps to establish craving as a, one, of the, one of the mechanisms that links high negative affect to opioid misuse. Next slide. And I only have a couple slides left that I want to highlight some important population-based studies uh, and larger samples that have been done. Um, and I think this will also help set the stage for the, for the next speaker. So there's some really good work that's been done by Mark Sullivan and his group at the University of Washington. And there's been many studies like this. This was actually the first uh, that I know of. This is in 2010, looking at almost a million insurance claims records from commercial and Medicaid claims and really finding that those patients who are prescribed opioids more frequently are those, as you would imagine, with depression or anxiety disorders. They were two to, two to three times as likely to be prescribed an opioid. And you can understand why. These patients have high levels of pain. They're functioning poorly. They're treatment resistant. It becomes a very natural thing for physicians to try opioids when everything else may not have worked. Next slide. And of course, the irony is you can understand why those patients get prescribed opioids, but they're also one of the most vulnerable group for opioid misuse. And so uh, Mark Sullivan followed up that study um, with the study in over a thousand chronic pain patients looking at opioid misuse using many of the same outcomes that I described before to, to judge misuse, uh, really find the same relationship that patients with major depression were twice as likely to misuse opioids. Most commonly, it was by self-increasing their dose. And uh, this result's been replicated in several studies. And one of the most recent is a study that done at Stanford, uh, Beth Darnell and myself are authors on this, uh, find the exact same relationship that negative affect is one of the strongest predictors of opioid misuse. Uh, next slide. And uh, sadly, you know, high negative affect is also an important predictor of opioid overdose. Um, and this is an insurance claim data study from 18 million patients. And I highlighted uh, here in yellow on the right, of course, uh, being diagnosed with a substance use disorder was the greatest predictor, odds ratio of 10.2, but that was next followed by depression, odds ratio of 3.1 and other mental health disorders. Next slide. And interestingly, this is a nice study done at the University of Pittsburgh uh, that was published uh, this year, and they looked at repeat overdoses. So people who had already been overdosed on, um, who had already overdosed on opioids, and looking at what was a predictor of subsequent overdoses. And that's um, these odds ratios on the right. And really finding that the negative affective disorders are really important predictors of repeat overdose. And if you look below, they actually about the same odds ratios, same strength as substance use disorder. So, uh, so it's very interesting as well. Um, next slide, please. Great, so that, that wraps things up. I want to uh, thank uh, collaborators in many different parts of the country that I work closely with and have mentored me uh, over the years. And uh, this little thing on the right, the worst doesn't happen, that's actually uh, a pretty good message for anti-catastrophizing that you might use in cognitive behavioral therapy. And believe it or not, I saw that as a graffiti on a sidewalk in an alley in Pittsburgh. So that's the kind of city we live in where people are trying to help each other out. So uh, thanks so much. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Wasson. Um, I see there is a one clarifying question uh, from Linda Barr. Uh, it says, you mentioned poor pain outcomes for medications procedures for those with high negative outcome, not seen with acupuncture. Any thoughts about why this might be? Yeah, yeah, so, so we published a study on that and, and I think, um, these treatments that really have a combined psychosocial effects. I mean, there's a lot of positive mood enhancing effects with acupuncture. It clearly modulates the nervous system in many different areas in many different ways. We don't know exactly, but it does something to the nervous system. We didn't see that, that kind of benefit. I mean, I'm sorry, we didn't see that difference, right? Between, we didn't see a negative effect of negative affect. The same is true for physical therapy. So it depends about the type of physical therapy that's being done, but um, there's some studies showing that negative affect is a predictor of poor outcomes in PT. 
But if you do something like a free avoidance physical therapy, you actually see uh, equal outcomes to, in people with low and high negative affect. Um, another question from Eric Garland. Have you looked at positive affect and negative affect as orthogonal predictors of opiate pain outcomes? Yeah, so, so we haven't done that. The, uh, you know, the measures of positive affect um, aren't quite as good. Most people use the PANS, you know, as you know, um, and a lot of people haven't looked at that. They're starting to, but th if it's any help, the studies that have looked at both negative and positive affect, not including opioids, so in patients with pain, just different uh, non-opioid kind of studies, they really find that the, the effects are there for positive effect, but it's much lower. I mean, you may have, for instance, a correlation of like 0.6 between a negative affect and an outcome, and a, the correlation for positive affect is 0.2. Um, there's a couple of nice studies um, in knee arthritis showing a positive affect in intervention improving um, pain just by addressing people's positive affect, but the effect sizes are kind of small. They're, they're legitimate, they're good, and it's a well-designed study, but you tend to see smaller effect sizes when you intervene on positive affect versus negative affect. And we didn't have time to go into all the studies that actually intervened and improved negative affect in the treatment of chronic pain. And, and those tend to show moderate effect size. Okay, thank you very much. We're gonna to move to our next speaker, to our last speaker. Um, so we're gonna have Tai Vu Park present on challenges with opiate and benzo co-prescribing from co-abuse. So, so Thank you for the opportunity to speak on this topic uh, of co-prescribing benzodiazepines for patients receiving opioids. Uh, it's a topic that I've spent a bit of time thinking about, um, both through research that I've conducted and also through uh, clinical work as an addiction psychiatrist. Next slide. In the CDC guidelines for prescribing uh, opioids for chronic pain published in 2016, uh, one of the recommendations was that clinicians should avoid prescribing opioid pain medication and benzodiazepines concurrently whenever possible. Uh, and in this talk, I'm going to briefly review the evidence supporting this recommendation and uh, also discuss reasons for why co-prescribing benzodiazepines and opioids is still common. Next slide. Um, Though uh, co-prescribing is a practice found in a, major a minority of patients receiving opioids for pain, um, from 2002 to 2014, co-prescribing increased by 41%, up to 10% of patients. Uh, and between 2001 and 2010, uh, benzodiazepines were co-prescribed at 16% of chronic pain visits. And perhaps more worrying, uh, benzodiaz benzodiazepines were uh, being prescribed more commonly to higher risk patients. Uh, so those with uh, addiction histories and higher opioid doses. Next slide. This is from uh, the TEDS data set of state-run addiction treatment facilities that found that uh, SUD treatment admissions greatly increased uh, from 2000 to 2010 uh, for the benzodiazepine plus opioid analgesic combination. Uh, next slide. And likewise, uh, ED visits increased between 2005 and 2011. Uh, the blue line represents benzodiazepines alone. The red is uh, benzodiazepines plus opioids. Uh, uh, the green is benzodiazepines plus alcohol. And uh, the bottom line is all three substances. Uh, they all increased over time. Uh, and, and now many of those admissions and ED visits likely involved people who were not prescribed opioids, but were using them non-medically. Uh, next slide. So what we did was we studied the association between uh, benzodiazepines and drug overdose mortality in a cohort of veterans who were prescribed opioids for pain. So we knew that they were being prescribed these medications. And what we found was that patients uh, currently co-prescribed a benzodiazepine and opioid analgesic uh, were nearly four times, uh, had four times greater risk of overdose than those prescribed an opioid alone. And we also found that this risk uh, of overdose increased as the benzodiazepine dose increased. Um, and notably, we found that half of the patients who died of an overdose 
uh, were being co-prescribed at the time of death, uh, despite only about a quarter of patients being prescribed a benzodiazepine at any time in the study period. Next slide. And uh, subsequent studies have found similar results. Uh, code prescribing was associated with an increased risk of overdose uh, in a privately insured patient population. Uh, and code prescribing was associated with self-inflicted uh, and violence-related injury and all-cause mortality in a VA study that used propensity score analysis. Next slide. And of course, there are other risks of benzodiazepines. And this is not necessarily in those co-prescribed, but particularly in older adults, we see some of these risks. Uh, in one systematic review, five out of five studies found benzodiazepines used by people with Alzheimer's uh, was associated with cognitive deterioration. Uh, and another review found that six of seven studies found an association between benzodiazepines and increased risk of hip fractures. Next slide, please. Um, so since the CDC guidelines on opioids for chronic pain uh, were published, uh, one study found that the release of the guidelines was associated with an increased rate of decline in co-prescribing. And another study also found that a modest decrease um, uh, was found in co-prescribing, um, but, uh, but that the proportion of overlapping co-prescribing days didn't change. Um, so let's say fewer people overall received a co-prescription, but if you were a patient who got a benzodiazepine, the intensity of that co-prescribing uh, didn't change. Um, and then a third study found that co-prescribing rates reduced uh, after an FDA boxed warning about co-prescribing, and this was in the same year that the CDC guidelines were released. Uh, but they also found that there was still substantial co-prescribing. So there is, or there have been recent decreases in co-prescribing, but clearly the practice still persists. And I don't think that this is something that's gonna go away uh, quickly. And given the concerning evidence uh, regarding co-prescribing, I do think it's worth asking why the practice still persists. Uh, next slide. Um, and one reason is that as Dr. Wasan uh, um, spoke about in depth, um, anxiety disorders are common in chronic pain patients. 35% uh, of chronic pain patients had an anxiety disorder in one large population-based study. And uh, anxiety is associated with poor outcomes, such as pain severity, pain-related disability, and increased risk of prescription opioid misuse. And that really makes uh, treating anxiety effectively a priority in this patient population. Next slide. Uh, and according uh, to one meta-analysis, benzodiazepines, you can advance one further, uh, are amongst the most effective treatments for anxiety disorders. Now, notably, this is not in a patient with, or a group with chronic pain or uh, opioid use disorder, uh, but it is noticeable, notable that benzodiazepines are effective treatments for anxiety. Uh, next slide, please. And there are real advantages, um, especially as a prescriber and a patient, uh, to using benzodiazepines compared to other medications. Uh, they have relatively good tolerability, uh, and they have a fast, fast onset of action, which is, can be a both a plus and a minus. Um, additionally, they can be used as uh, an as-needed treatment. Next slide. And uh, the other tr uh, anxiety treatments don't come without their problems. Uh, SSRIs have tolerability issues. Uh, people can have increased anxiety and insomnia when they first start them. They can have uh, nausea and significant uh, sexual dysfunction. And they may take six to eight weeks uh, to work at all, uh, if they work at all. And like uh, benzodiazepines, they have no withdrawal syndromes associated with them. Uh, there was one large managed care database study that found that 57% of patients who were prescribed an SSRI for anxiety were non-adherent at six months. Um, and uh, psychotherapies, which obviously can be effective for tr the treatment of anxiety, have significant barriers to dissemination. It takes time and money to, uh, to properly trained therapists in these specific um, psychotherapies, uh, and they can also take some time to be effective. Um, next slide. And uh, another concern with prescribing benzodiazepines is that patients will become addicted to them. 
but the risk of benzodiazepine addiction is believed to be relatively low. Uh, this is from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health. And for those who first tried a drug in this study, they looked at how many people were addicted to the drug the following year. Uh, and benzodiazepines here listed as tranquilizers uh, had one of the lowest percentages of people addicted. Next slide, please. And uh, this is mirrored by data from treatment admissions uh, for benzodiazepines in the TEDS data set. And this slide shows that admissions to these facilities uh, organized uh, by the primary substance of abuse. Uh, the top line is um, alcohol. Uh, and the bottom line is benzodiazepines. Um, and though this number has doubled over the past decade, getting admitted for a primary benzodiazepine problem is, is pretty rare. Next slide. Um, and in a recent survey of prescribers in the VA, uh, when they were asked about uh, reasons for co-prescribing, among the most common reasons were not having enough time to negotiate discontinuation uh, and uh, stating that the patient was stable and therefore didn't need a change in treatment. Uh, and uh, a feeling that there was a lack of information on other treatments, uh, particularly behavioral treatments. Um, and when prescribers were asked about discontinuation, they commonly reported that discontinuing benzodiazepines will be too difficult and would make patients suffer. And indeed, more than 30% of prescribers perceive negative or extremely negative changes for patients after long-term benzodiazepine therapy was discontinued. Next slide. And there may be other benefits of co-prescribing benzodiazepines that we don't fully understand. Um, we have also conducted a study of co-prescribing in patients who are receiving treatment for opioid use disorder. Uh, we looked at all Massachusetts residents who received buprenorphine between 2011 and 2015. And uh, maybe not surprisingly, we found that co-prescribing was associated with increased risk of non-fatal opioid overdose, fatal opioid overdose, and all-cause mortality. Uh, but interestingly, uh, we also found that benzodiazepine prescription was associated with a lower risk of buprenorphine discontinuation. Um, that's to say it was associated with improved buprenorphine treatment retention. Um, now, I, I don't know if this has any relevance necessarily for the chronic pain population, um, but I think in a similar way that um, continuing to prescribe opioids for chronic pain may be associated with better treatment retention. I think Dr. Cortez lightly touched on this. Um, Co-prescribing benzodiazepines may also be associated with better treatment retention in chronic pain patients. And certainly for those chronic pain patients who are being prescribed buprenorphine, certain, uh, benzodiazepines might be associated with better treatment retention. Next slide. Uh, now, we also conducted a qualitative study of patients who received methadone or buprenorphine for opioid use disorder. Uh, and we also, um, and so we interviewed patients who use benzodiazepines regularly, and we also interviewed their treatment providers. Uh, and we found that, um, that patients who used benzodiazepines used them both appropriately and inappropriately. So patients uh, would take them for anxiety or insomnia but they would also um, misuse them and use them to get high or to boost their methadone. And oftentimes it was in the same patient. Um, and we found that, um, interestingly, patients spoke about learning to use benzodiazepines safely over time um, and were more able to do so when they were more stable in treatment. So for example, someone who was actively using illicit opioids or maybe just started methadone treatment or buprenorphine treatment were more likely to uh, take the, the medication unsafely or to misuse them, while people who were um, more stable in treatment and really more stable in their lives um, were able to, to take these medications, these potentially risky medications, in a, in a safer way. Um, no, go back one. I'm not done yet. Uh, and uh, we, uh, you know, also interestingly, what we found was that the majority of these patients who were um, using benzodiazepines regularly also spoke about aspiring someday to discontinue benzodiazepines. None of them really wanted to stay on benzodiazepines for the rest of their lives. Um, it was just a, it was sort of a, a, an issue of self-efficacy more than anything else. Um, and then when we interviewed providers, um, 
we found that there was this fundamental disconnect in treatment, um, and that was that uh, patients prioritized the benefits of benzodiazepine therapy, while providers really prioritized the risks. And, um, and it's that, I think that disconnect that often leads to treatment disengagement um, and sometimes mistrust uh, and, and can perhaps lead to other uh, poor treatment outcomes. So when patients and providers could better balance those risks and benefits, you know, a lot of, notably a lot of um, patients didn't know the risks and just prioritized the, the benefits. Likewise, the opposite for the providers. Um, so when you can better balance those, uh, I think patients may be more likely to attempt dose reduction or discontinuation. Um, next slide. And finally, um, obviously there are patients who I think require uh, uh, benzotapering. And when we do uh, encounter those patients, unfortunately cl clinicians have little guidance on how to do it effectively in patients with chronic pain or opioid use disorder. And uh, most of our data is from studies of older adults who use benzos for insomnia and adults who use benzodiazepines for panic disorder or generalized anxiety disorder. But we do know that gradual tapering is more effective than abrupt tapering. Uh, and we know that adding a psychosocial intervention, typically CBT-based, um, can help patients complete the taper and stay benzo-free. Last slide. So in summary, co-prescribing has declined since the release of the CDC guidelines for prescribing opioids for chronic pain, yet it still persists. And uh, prescribing benzodiazepines potentially has both risks and benefits in patients receiving opioids. Though I think we need to do a better job of identifying who might do poorly or might do well on a benzodiazepine. Uh, and more guidance is needed to help clinicians minimize the risks of co-prescribing and how to safely and effectively taper benzodiazepine use in this patient population. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Park. Um, there are two clarifying questions. One is from, the first one is from Dave Clark. Um, the slide, he says the slides indicate substantial increases in benzo and opiate use starting in the early to mid 2000s. Is this spike at all related to the greater availability of prescription drug monitoring programs? Um, <clears throat> so I'm a little confused by that question because I think that generally PMPs are, are um, associated or hope to be associated with decreases in, uh, in the combined prescribing because people can see what other prescribers are prescribing, especially if the benzo and opioid are prescribed by two different providers. Um, I don't know if that answers the question. I think that maybe there, there have been decreases actually. Um, so prior to the CDC guidelines, there are some reports that um, co-prescribing was already declining before the CDC guidelines came out. And that may be because of uh, greater knowledge of, uh, general greater knowledge of the, the risks of co-prescribing, but also maybe um, the increase in prescription drug monitoring programs. Okay, and uh, the second question is from Shelly Sue. Have you seen if opiate benzo co-prescription is associated with increased naloxone prescription? So um, I don't, I, I haven't looked at that specifically, but I don't know if others have. Um, it does um, certainly make sense in terms of, um, of risk gratifying patients and um, using interventions for the highest risk patients and certainly uh, the uh, uh, making naloxone more available to the highest risk group, um, people who have opioids and benzos and perhaps other uh, mental health disorders um, makes a lot of sense. Okay, great. So thank you all for your great presentations and uh, let's move on uh, to our panelists and I will just go in the order. Um, first one I have on the list, it's Brian Ahmedani. Can you please provide your thoughts and comments? Yeah, so thanks. Uh, first of all, I just want to say thanks to all of the uh, presenters. This, I think, was a really good session uh, and really kind of highlighted several of the key areas that um, are, are really important in this discussion. So, um, you know, a couple things really stood out to me. And, you know, first of all, it's very clear 
you know, it's very clear why we're doing this HEAL initiative. There's just so many complexities and so much uh, that is tangled together between all of these different conditions. It's very clear that, you know, alcohol and opioids have a unique relationship and so does uh, depression and pain. You know, we, you know, we talked a lot about kind of how all those things in, get entangled with each other and how they, they, you know, first of all, you know, we have an opportunity here to really think about disentangling those relationships uh, but in, and to find unique treatments that aren't specific to one of those conditions, but that really can kind of help facilitate uh, improvement in overall lifestyle for and and just in well-being for all of those conditions together and I think that's what sometimes we miss so much is, is we focus on treatment uh, or we focus on identification of risk of one condition and don't kind of think about all of these conditions and how they work together and, and all of these different factors and how they work together so that it's it's very clear it was obviously woven through every single one of these presentations highlighted actually throughout the entire day and um, you know through the entire initiative you know we've been doing some studies uh, in our group as well across a lot of different group uh, uh, organizations around the country about you know thinking about opioids and and, and you know studying how opioid initiation of new opioid prescriptions increase risk of depression uh, we've also been studying those unique relationships with suicide and uh, and, and, you know, when people, uh, either are, are uh, the, the increased risk, uh, with, with pain, but then, and opioid use, but then in the contribution of opioid use to suicide risk, but then, you know, the potential for, you know, deprescribing of opioids, as we learned earlier today, and how that could even contribute to suicide. So there's so many complexities here. And I think this, this initiative is so important to be able to work through all those and to find the right uh, interventions. What I think really stuck, struck out to me in the, uh, stuck out to me in this session was uh, something that, that uh, I think, I think is, is really important for each one of these areas. And that's something that um, the first presenter, uh, Dr. Wickwitz, uh, mentioned. And, and it was really important at the end. And, and she said, you know, we must consider uh, exclusion and inclusion criteria for our studies. I think for so long, we've spent a lot of time trying to, to exclude all the patients that didn't fit perfectly within our view of you know, uh, within our study question, because it was much tighter to just look at patients with one condition and look at a single outcome or multiple outcomes. The problem is, is that the vast majority of people that have that single condition also have other conditions. And we've, we've learned about uh, all of that here in this session, that, that often these patients don't just have one thing going on. Uh, and I think the, the second, uh, presentation illustrated really clearly how uh, depression and psychopathology was so interwoven and that so many patients that have pain and or are using opioids uh, also have also have depression that first presentation showed that those comorbidities between using uh, alcohol and uh, and opioids uh, were quite common that people were were um, you know using both of those, for you know, self self uh, medicating uh, in in a lot of circumstances, and maybe almost up to a third, or or at least uh, or at least a quarter. So so you know, it, it, it's really important that when we think about designing studies, that we it's not it's it is certainly easier from a scientific perspective to exclude everybody who may cause confusion. Uh, or distract from the research design or make it more complex. But yet the next, the next wave of, of um, science really calls us uh, to really be considerate about those exclusion criteria and, and really think more in the lens of inclusion, to really bring 
to, to really include patients that represent real world settings, that represent real world uh, experiences because people are, are, are having so many things going together. So I, I, I just wanted to highlight those things specifically. Also, real good point on that last uh, presentation by Dr. Park. Uh, it, it was really interesting how he talked about um, that providers uh, were really worried about risks and patients were really worried, were more concerned about the potential benefits. And I think that's why, you know, we, I think we have Pecori here in the, in, the, in the meeting, but, you know, a really interesting uh, thing that we should consider is, you know, is we've often kind of left that patient voice out and, and it's really, you know, whether or not we always go that direction, it's really important to listen to that direction so that we can consider both possibilities as potential outcomes that, 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 you know, that there are, there are multiple sides to every story and that both must be considered. So I think that's kind of the biggest uh, the biggest points that stood out to me, but I think a, a really great session. And just again, thanks to all the presenters. Great, thank you. Uh, let's move on to Kathy Bradley. If you can, thank you. And can, can your you discussion still about three, three up to three minutes. That would be great because <laughs> I would like. You. To I'll be I'll be quick. And let me thank the presenters um, for three great presentations and Brian for calling it together. I want to say a couple of things, uh, just kind of backing up. I think we're we're seeing that these conditions are all intertwined. Um, I want to put a primary care perspective on it for a second and just share with you some numbers because I think um, so. For instance, benzodiazepines. Ted showed how rare they are and how common alcohol use disorders are. We, from a study that from the Proud trial phase one where we had. 13,000 patients with OUD in primary care. I just want to tell you a kind of the, the prevalence data because I think the take home I'm moving towards is that we all, each patient will have many conditions. And one of the challenges we're going to have is how to address many conditions at the same time. So in the PRO trial of people with OUD, 89% had a pain disorder. So it's kind of the population we're talking about. 28% had a recognized document alcohol use disorder. In another similar study in Kaiser alone, 15% have unhealthy alcohol use. I wanna highlight and talk for just a second about alcohol because I believe that if we had a measure of alcohol like we do for benzo, we would be measuring it. It's where many people are moving to when they're, they're tapered off opioids. When we were testing a shared decision-making aid um, with a patient with alcohol use disorder. His story was, well, when they took away my methadone, I got onto alcohol and that's the only way I can function. And so, so when we push the balloon one place, it's going to pop up. And if we're not measuring those things, um, we're going to be, in, we're going to miss the story. So I think I really wanted to highlight alcohol, first of all, but also in the PROUD trial, in a primary care population with OUD, 50 2% of patients have substance use disorder. Um, cannabis was 16%, stimulant use disorder, 18%. So I think as we start to think about taking care of these patients, they're extraordinarily complicated and we need a team. And, and I think we're gonna have to articulate to the healthcare system complexity and the need of patients if we're gonna treat them in primary care and want to um, kind of there is an agenda. It's going to team, but it's also going to take based care and our, our developed systems of medicine that can be integrated into clinical care. So the, the primary care patient caring for OUD and pain has a chance of knowing all the other comorbidities and the mental team. And then I wanted to return a little bit to the patient because Lynn and I are designing a trial, working, starting up a trial where we're addressing OUD and depression, and we're going to change disorder and cannabis use disorder and whatever the patient brings. And to me, the core concept is going to decide what they're ready to be treated with. And the patients won't be ready to be treated for OUD, but they might be pain. So we need people treating pain who know how to then segue into treating 
OUD. And I think as we design studies, we're going to need that patient preference at the them, which is going to really, um, I think, innovative designs. Um, I think I'll just stop there for now, just to keep move us along to this. And although I have to say, thank you. Great, thank you. Okay, next one I have Jesse Merlin. Great, thank you very much. Um, just wanted to add a couple of additional points. I really appreciated the um, these presentations and the prior panelists comments. Um, so one theme that I keep hearing, I think, is a tension between developing interventions that are robust enough that they can be used to treat real world people who have all the real world overlapping conditions that we see, right? So not just people who have pain, but don't have anything else or, you know, pain plus AUD, but nothing else or pain plus depression, nothing else, you know, people who, you know, the interventions that are robust enough to, um, to, to really be able to address real world people. In addition, and maybe tension isn't the right word, but maybe it's balance. Um, in addition, we also want to think about precision medicine approaches. How do we, as um, Dr. Sterrell said earlier, how do we know which patients to taper? How do we know which patients to continue? How do we know who's going to benefit and who's going to have harm? So I think um, really thinking about that tension or that balance um, is something that I've been thinking about a lot today as I've been listening to some of these presentations and in particular some of the last comments. Um, something else that goes along with that is I think we've um, you know, seen some data presented about various treatment modalities, pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic, that have fairly small effect sizes. And so I think thinking about how one might combine um, various treatments um, in a particular individual to obtain the optimal um, uh, approach for that person and kind of take advantage of these multiple effect sizes. When I'm talking to somebody and they say, so you know, I've heard about acupuncture, I've heard about uh, physical therapy, I've heard about this, I've heard about that, and I've done kind of dribs and drabs of all of these things over the years, like, what should I do? And I think the answer is typically for most people, some kind of combination of all of those things over a long period of time, combined with good coping and self-management strategies. And so how do you know which ones of those things to combine for a particular individual, I think is a, um, a really interesting research challenge. Um, so something else that I've been thinking a lot about today um, is another group of people that we have systematically excluded um, from studies of chronic pain um, and of OUD, which is individuals with serious illness and particularly individuals with cancer. So, um, you know, we often hear people talk about chronic non-cancer pain and there's this kind of cancer exceptionalism where you know, and I, I come from the background, I'm a palliative care physician. Um, and so in addition to, to doing addiction and pain, and so, you know, in a way we think about that maybe as kind of protecting patients uh, with cancer from, um, you know, what would be draconian opioid limiting type uh, measures. But when we don't study the impact of opioids in this population, we don't really understand the risks and the benefits and the alternatives. Um, that and also chronic pain treatments when we don't really have the same robust um, body of evidence, for example, for self-management strategies in um, patients with cancer, then um, you know we're really we're really not serving this patient population. And the other thing that that kind of leads to, and I think Dr. Binswanger said it really well, like where do we treat these patients? I, I you know who have pain and OUD, I think this is particularly pronounced in this patient population where, you know, you've got somebody who's in, let's say, a methadone OTP and they develop cancer. Well, now they're too sick for the methadone OTP. The primary care physician may or may not feel like they can manage their, probably, you know, doesn't have a BUP waiver and can't manage their opioid use disorder. Um, they have pain related to their cancer, but their oncologist feels like they're too complicated and the palliative care physician is not equipped. So who, you know, is it, is it that we need to create a new specialty for, you know, these folks who are really, you know, in the overlap of these things, or is it that we need to figure out better implementation strategies for the, the things that we already know um, work? So I just kind of wanted to put a plug in there for thinking about this particular um, population. And then um, I guess I will just 
conclude my remarks just with one other thought, which is um, going back to, I think the first talk we had this morning, which was great, which was on stigma. And so, and I know I need to do this myself and um, I'm always reminding my colleagues of this and asking them to remind me that we are the ones who sort of set the stage and set the bar for um, what is an appropriate way to talk about individuals with substance use disorders. And so trying to make sure that we are not um, using language like drug seeking, except when it, reflecting something that a patient said um, in quotations, but, um, you know, or God forbid abuse or, um, or using, making sure we use person first language. So not a um, chronic pain patient, but somebody who has chronic pain. Um, these are things that I think will go a long way to making sure that our patients feel comfortable um, in, in seeking care from us um, and that our care is as effective as it can be. So um, that's all I have. Okay, thank you. And our last panelist is uh, Robert Kurz. Your thoughts? Yes, good afternoon. So I was gonna be cute and uh, play a game with a polling question and then respond to all that, but we don't have enough time. So we won't do that. I want to uh, emphasize a couple of points, the focus on uh, addressing the person with pain as opposed to the pain patient, excluding everything else. I attribute that terminology to Dennis Turk, but it's probably in everybody in this, in this uh, body's nomenclature now. Um, so it's, it's true that people with chronic pain have multiple uh, morbidities, including medical, as Jesse just reminded us, cancer, for example, or history of cancer that may have actually been the initial exposure to opioids, by the way, um, and uh, lots of other uh, medical conditions and, of course, mental health and substance use disorder uh, conditions. I want to emphasize what was uh, has been kind of a theme throughout here is uh, that r recently mentioned is the concept of pragmatic trials and the uh, importance of, of um, uh, you know, in allowing people with even maybe moderate levels of various mental health and substance use disorder conditions to be in our chronic pain trials. And I put in a plug and a thank you to uh, Dave Clark and the NCCIH but also my DOD and VA colleagues for collaborating in a tri-government agency partnership to fund the NIH DOD VA Pain Management Collaboratory, which is focusing on uh, pragmatic clinical trials of non-pharmacologic approaches to pain management in the Veterans Health System and uh, Defense Health Agency. Um, it's in that context that we're paying attention to careful phenotyping of the patients, regardless of which of the 11 trials um, our patients are being recruited for, um, in, including specific attention to um, harmonizing around uh, measures of depressive and anxiety symptom uh, severity, as well as definite common definitions of uh, chronic pain, high impact chronic pain, and a common data set. Um, and all of this, I hope, uh, including especially several of those projects that are really focusing on models of studying models of care uh, as opposed to individual approaches really are important steps in the, I think in the direction we're all headed. I did want to make a couple comments specifically about my pet passion which is or my pet disorder or depressive disorder. I think it's a, a particularly important uh, problem to address in the context of this uh, discussion. I appreciate Ajay's uh, uh, presentation about negative affect more generally, but and zooming in on the importance of screening for uh, doing a comprehensive assessment that leads to actual identification of major depressive disorder when it's present. Um, this this actually is can be a life threatening disorder, um, potentially in the context of of uh, pain, chronic pain, and opioid use disorder either alone or in combination. And there are effective treatments, pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic. And so I do think that in the, uh, although we wanna encourage continued uh, growth of integrative uh, or trials can, uh, of integrative treatments, such as uh, Katie's trial with, with Kevin Vowles, uh, developing a novel non-pharmacologic approach to 
uh, people with uh, veterans in their case with uh, co-occurring um, chronic pain and opioid use disorder. Um, and notwithstanding the SCAMP trial of Kirk Kroenke, Matt Baer, and others that uh, demonstrated an effect of optimized antidepressant therapy and, and uh, pain self-management intervention in reducing pain symptoms and uh, uh, actually um, increasing remission rates of, uh, from major depressive disorder in, their, in a proportion of their sample. I think we really could, um, we do need to focus on trying to encourage practitioners to identify depression when it's present and to treat it. And if not, if, if it's not within the competency of the provider or the setting to treat it, to make referrals to um, um, uh, treat it in hopefully a coordinated and integrated way as a part of a comprehensive plan of care. So that's really uh, the things that I wanted to emphasize. Um, and maybe I'll turn it back to Ivana. Okay, thank you. Uh, so the floor is now open for general discussion. Are there any specific uh, general questions that you have for our panelists or speakers? Actually, there was one question that I did not get to. Um, it was directed to um, Katie. And it was from John uh, Farrar. Uh, it says, understanding that there is no treatment that works in everyone, would you agree that there are at least some people who do not respond adequately to acceptance and commitment therapy? And what you, what would you offer, how would you offer to treat those patients? Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. And certainly uh, the, there's heterogeneity in patient response to treatments. I'm actually not an expert in acceptance and commitment therapy for pain. I think other people on this Zoom call are more expert in that, and I welcome you to respond. I will, I will speak to that question for mindfulness-based treatments because we certainly have uh, plenty of patients who do not respond as well or do not uh, have a good fit. Um, interestingly, we, we tend to find that it's patients who are less severe who, who maybe would benefit from a brief, more skills-based approach that seem to not want to stick it out in the mindfulness-based intervention. It's, and I'm not sure if that's the same for ACT um, for patients with chronic pain. Um, and we find that it's actually the most, of, in, in our experience with mindfulness-based relapse prevention, it's the patients who are most severe, actually with, with high levels of co-occurring uh, depressive depression and anxiety symptoms that seem to do best in mindfulness-based interventions. And so I think, you know, the first step is kind of to understand which trials are, or which of these treatments are effective, and then obviously moving towards, as Eric Garland mentioned earlier, a precision medicine approach to understanding who responds best. Um, and But certainly, I think, uh, fortunately, most of these interventions are, 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 you know, don't result in a lot of adverse events, so they might not be as effective initially. Uh, and certainly we would want to steer people to more effective interventions. And, and I think if the third wave therapies are, third wave therapies such as um, acceptance and commitment therapy or mindfulness-based approaches are not effective, then moving back towards our traditional behavioral therapies and cognitive behavioral therapies, skills-based approach. And of course, uh, integrated rehab um, has, has also shown to be very effective. So that's what I would say. Thanks for that question. And I, and I open it up to anyone else who, who has greater expertise in ACT for pain than I do. Thank you, Katie. I'm checking the chat if there are any more questions. I don't see any questions. Um, it looks like Eric may have a response to Katie's question or something else. And also, Beth, I appreciate your insight here, too. Yes, you had raised it and lowered it. Sorry about that, Beth. Okay, I see a few raised hands. I'm not sure which one was the first one. Um, let's go maybe with Eric. Uh, really quickly, I'm, I'm not an ACT person either, but I, I definitely agree with Katie that with regard to mindfulness, or at least uh, mindfulness-oriented recovery enhancement, 
the treatment is most efficacious for the most severe patients, not only the ones who have the most severe uh, comor comorbid psychiatric conditions, but also their people who are higher, have higher comm scores actually do better. Um, but I really wanted, also wanted to comment on what, what Bob had raised about the integrated uh, approach and that the, the VA system and the, and the military at lar large, I mean, really are, are uh, they're amazing in their ability to do coordinated uh, and integrated care. And it's, we don't see that, that, that level of coordination in, uh, in typical civilian settings. So I think there are big lessons to be learned from the VA system about how to do this right. Okay. Uh, next person who raised the question was Beth. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to dovetail with um, what both Katie and Eric were speaking on. And um, just to bring to the forefront that ACT is a variant of cognitive behavioral therapy. And these are skills based treatments and mindfulness is as well. And so getting back to a point that Eric made early on, which is that, you know, we're really trying to enhance self regulation of cognition and emotion. And our biggest problem right now isn't so much figuring out what works, it's giving people access to it in a way that works for them. Um, we just finished a five year R01 um, funded from NCCIH. And what we've been studying is how to compress eight weeks of cognitive behavioral therapy skills based treatment into two hours, a single session. And we're going to be submitting our manuscript in the next month, but it's highly promising. And, you know, this is, you know, my personal opinion. I think it, it kind of goes back to a larger theme is that it's, you know, in a lot of ways, we know what works. We have trouble translating it out, scaling what works to the people who need it. So we need to be thinking at a systems level of how to do that. And the last point I wanted to make is that um, there's been several people, I, I think Katie brought this up, but a lot of people echoed it, that we really need to you know, dismantle this homogenous clinical trials um, focus and account for the heterogeneity in our patient population so that our results are more generalizable. And if we're gonna do that, I'm a huge proponent of that, but that needs to happen at the institute and agency level, that needs to happen at the level of NIH, because if we put in our applications proposing to do these types of studies, we're going to need massive samples and massive budgets. And so the announcements need to reflect this call to action in this regard. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you. The next person I have who raised a hand is Kathy. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. Yeah, let me pick up on that access wise and let me say something kind of outrageous there. But I think so in primary care, about 20% of people with an OUD will get treatment. And that's because most primary care providers and most mental health providers and most pain providers do not prescribe buprenorphine for addiction. I think the, um, the sort of dramatic Thing that could have the biggest effect reaching all these patients with all these comorbidities would be a trial where you went into health systems and you got them to require that providers who prescribe opioids prescribe buprenorphine. When I, when I get credentialed, I can't say, well, I don't really like anticoagulants. They're kind of, I don't like them. They're dangerous or insulin. I don't like that. And yet we let people do that with buprenorphine. And I think if we're going to get radical, we have to first of all say, prescribers have to treat this disease. And then we can start doing the behavioral interventions to go along with it to treat the 80% you know, of people that'll have anxiety and or depression in primary care. But if we don't change that, and so I think it would not be a hard trial to do, and I wanted to put that out there. The other thing I think we haven't really touched on today that really needs to be on the agenda is cannabis, because cannabis is increasing, it's becoming legal in our system. 19% of people use it, people are using it for pain. People come in, we give them a DSM checklist, 30% of the patients who are using daily 
um, in our system have a cannabis use disorder. And so that's another place that we really need to have on the, on the radar as we go into enveloping whole patient care. Thanks. Thank you. And then the next person I have um, is Barbara St. Marie. So I just wanted to comment about acceptance commitment therapy. So we did a, a pilot uh, study. It was under an R23 and uh, uh, 24 uh, for on acceptance commitment therapy in the VA uh, system for prevention of post-surgical uh, prolongation of pain um, and opioid use. And we we actually had, because Lillian Dindo did this, was she uh, developed a one-day uh, acceptance commitment therapy. It was actually five hours uh, long and uh, compared it to treatment as usual and uh, for people undergoing orthopedic surgery. And we found that in three months time that the veterans receiving acceptance commitment therapy exhibited a greater and faster reduction of pain as well as opioid use. So, um, you know, right now there's a bigger trial uh, with Baylor uh, in University of Iowa, but, uh, uh, it really does show some promise. And I think condensing it, just like Beth, you said, making it more accept acceptable and decreasing the time element it takes to, to train people on this. Okay, um, I have Stefan raised the hand. Yes, thank you. Uh, as we think about what our best options are to offer individualized care, it's crucial to um, bear in mind that the people who pay for care or who employ us are themselves responding to a crisis related to the opioid prescriptions and sometimes they don't see uh, the value of all the various types of care we want to see happen they have a very narrow metric of what's going to be their institutional indicator of success so as we develop or try things including new ways of arranging care within primary care outside of it, I think it's really crucial that the agenda always include engaging with the payers, with the people who are developing the metrics for quality of care, and the managers who are deciding how to arrange their staff so that they can, in some way, understand that this might be a good thing to do, even though at the very moment they're doing it, it may be in some tension with a simplistic quality measure that they're currently trying to optimize. Um, but all of our best ideas will will run aground unless we have um, payers and metric partners who believe that it's worth caring for these patients. Great, thanks. Um, I have John Harar. You raised your hand. You probably need to unmute yourself. Yeah, no, I have to unmute two, two devices. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I actually, if you don't mind, wanted to um, come back to something that was mentioned earlier in the day, and then uh, Ajay Wasan commented on briefly in his talk, which was the measurement of craving uh, and the definition of craving or urges. And uh, let me start by asking Ajay, whether um, the measures that you actually showed in one of your slides um, are validated or are reasonable ways to think about measuring craving as something that we would be interested in doing in our patient population, and then how that measure relates to what you've ultimately put together for the COM um, as a way of trying to understand um, how best to judge whether um, patients are at risk for developing uh, opioid uh, use disorder. Yeah, thanks. So the, um, what we developed, some of the studies I showed are part of that validation and really it's those four questions that really hang together regarding craving and that we've kind of shown to be important in multiple studies and they really match up well with other craving items um, that have been validated in other disorders like alcohol or cocaine. Um, and also so do the segments of it. So we're, we've used it in multiple trials. We're continuing to use it in trials now that intervene on negative affect and, and pain together, um, including you know in patients who are prescribed opioids. So, so it's there. So I think that's that's part one. And then, you what was the part two, John? 
<laughs> um, it was the connection to the the calm and and thinking about how much the craving pays plays a role in in what you measure there. Yeah. So craving is a question on the calm, if I remember correctly. Right. Um, and so it's it's definitely part of what uh, is in the calm. And there's a short version of the calm now. And so again, these items hang very closely together in terms of of misuse. So, um, I mean, even just asking the craving question, just one question on craving, that's exactly what we found from the first study uh, was that craving question was from the, from the comp. Yeah. I don't know if that gets at what, reason, I don't know if that gets at it. Does that get at what you were asking? It, it does a little, and, and let me extend it just a little bit, which is that um, one of the things that we have, I've done a number of uh, third molar extract or a couple of third molar extraction studies, and <clears throat> very often the drug we use in, the treatment uh, component of that is uh, ibuprofen, uh, which works pretty well, but the patients are sent home with uh, a few, a couple, um, either hydrocodone or oxycodone. And what's interesting, if you ask those patients after they've gone home, a small number, probably three to four percent of them, uh, if you ask, will say, you know, when I took one, I really felt good. The majority of people who take them say it made me feel lousy, I didn't like the way it felt, it made me nauseous, uh, you know, it wasn't worth taking, et cetera. And what comes up is um, I've always wondered whether, in fact, you know, in thinking about young people that were likely to expose in, in various surgical procedures, it might be not an unreasonable thing to, to be sure to follow them up and ask um, in the, for the whole point of trying to uh, prevent them from going on to looking at and using more by some sort of intervention. And that really what we're talking about here is a craving or an urge. Um, and so I, that was the link to these. And uh, from where I sit, obviously the treatment of OUD and, and chronic pain together is a big issue and clearly needs to be addressed. But if we could prevent patients from getting there in the first place, um, then we might be able to address some of these issues in a in a more pro prospective preventive way. Yeah. So, so I'm really glad you said that because you said something really fascinating, which which is there, which is the 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 in our studies, which was um, craving as a suppression of negative affect, and what you mentioned also is craving as an enhancement of positive affect, right? Which is the reward mm -hmm. that people feel. Some people feel uh, for different substances. You know, it could be alcohol or anything. Um, and so I think that yeah. also needs to be te teased out because craving can mean different things, right? Depending on, on what its drivers are. So I think that's really fascinating what, what you suggested. And of course, you know, we don't know really if, if craving and uh, post-surgical pain is the same as craving regarding chronic pain. We, we just don't, we don't know that. I mean, but you know, you could, um, you know, as part of these validation studies, you could use some assessments of craving in all of these different pain trials and, and see what, what pairs out. You know, I think that's certainly the next logical step forward. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have Eric Garland. Bu building on what on what John said, I think it, it, in the patients who are endorsing the craving, uh, you know they're at risk because th there's such gross underreporting of craving in this population of patients who are prescribed opioids that those folks are basically screaming, "I'm in trouble." Uh, but I think. I think because uh, this is such a highly stigmatized problem and there's such reticence to report issues like craving, as well as don't underestimate the fact that from a brain perspective, there are, there are a lot of impairments in interoceptive awareness that are present in, the, in, in people with chronic pain, as well as people with addiction. So in other words, patients may not be able to feel the craving in their bodies. They not be, may not be able to recognize the sensations that we normally label as craving. Um, therefore, you know, we, in order to detect craving or the appetitive response, you may need non-self-report measures. Um, and, you know, in terms, you know, what's clinically transportable to the clinic, maybe it's performance-based cognitive tasks, like uh, an intentional bias task, like I've used in my studies. Maybe it's heart rate variability assessment while you're showing people Q, uh, a Q, some sort of a cue, uh, or maybe it's even EEG, but you may need some non non self report measure to get at it because uh, number one, people don't want to talk about it, or number two, 
as I said, they, they can't express it well because of the interoceptive deficits and maybe even alexithymia that shows up in, in, in folks with pain and addiction. Okay, thanks. Um, I have Beth. Yeah, I, thank you. I just wanted to respond um, as well to John's comment. And you got my attention because you said you were studying third molar surgery and um, we need better perioperative models for identifying who's at risk and then intervening in, in an appropriate way. And I think, you know, the discussion that we're having right now is could we use measures of craving to identify who might be at risk. And I'd just like to put forward an alternative model, which um, it isn't a competing model. They can exist in tandem, but it's to provide everybody with enhanced um, skills for managing perioperative pain. And so this is independent of whether a person is necessarily at risk, but it provides a preventative measure for everybody undergoing surgery who would be opioid exposed, whether for the first time or not. Um, last year, we published a study in which we offered women undergoing breast cancer surgery. Um, this was a randomized controlled trial, and they were either assigned to a digital skills-based um, pain intervention, um, CBT and mindfulness-based, or they were randomized to a digital health education control. And what we showed was that women who engaged with the skills-based program stopped um, prescription opioids six and a half days sooner after surgery than the women who were assigned to the health education control. So again, it's, it's free, it's widely available. Um, these are the type of preventive models we need to be considering in addition to um, screening and, and craving and, and treatment of opioid issues, but how do we better treat pain in the outpatient context and also in the perioperative context? Thank you. Um, so I see a hand, Katie, raise the hand. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on that. Another benefit of prevention approaches is it also helps to reduce stigma. If everyone is getting it, not just select patients at your clinic, mm -hmm. um, then that's it's it's it doesn't single people out as as high risk, which is is also really a benefit of preventive interventions and just assuming that everyone um, is equally likely to develop. Uh, at risk and and there's costs obviously associated with this, but if if we could develop briefer interventions that that can have preventive effects, as it sounds like like Beth's team did, then um, then that will help uh, prevent more cases, which is great. Thank you, Katie. Um, John. Yeah. Uh, so uh, just. Um, to 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 extend that um, a little bit um, and think about another aspect of pain therapy that is vital, um, which is the setting of realistic expectations of what to expect. And it gets gets to some of the data I think that you were showing, which is that you could train you know patients' pain didn't get better, but their ability to deal with it did. Um, and so, as a, just as a, um, a general question to folks who do um, opioid use disorder uh, research better than I do, is there a way of setting expectations for patients as to what they can expect um, during the therapy for those that plays a role in helping them to achieve uh, the ultimate goal of, of uh, not, not continuing to use it? It would seem to me that you know, there are obviously small steps and there's going to be some fallback occasionally and other kinds of issues, the same kinds of things that we talk about with pain patients, um, but that apply directly uh, to the treatment of, of, uh, of a, uh, you know, either opioid or alcohol or other use disorders. Um, and, you know, I know, Eric, you, you've talked somewhat about that, but I just, I, I hadn't heard the word sort of expectation related to opioid use disorder, uh, whereas it's a 
vital part of the treatment of chronic pain. I don't, I don't know what the literature says. On, I'm sorry for, for jumping in, but I, I don't know what the literature says on expectancy effects in addiction treatment, but I would be willing to bet they're very large as they are in every other form of, of uh, psychological intervention for X, Y, Z problem. I, I bet they're, they're quite robust. And that's one of the things that you, we want to maximize in these interventions is, is, you know, the, they call it the allegiance factors. So that's when the, when the, the patient and the clinician, their views on what is causing the problem are very, are, are aligned. Uh, and the patient buys into the, to whatever model is being presented by the clinician, as in this is sensible, this will help me. That's that we, we know from meta-analyses that that's a, that's a larger part of any, any treatment effect, whether it's, medic, whether it's a psychological intervention or a medical intervention for that matter. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I don't see any other, anybody else wants to ask a question. Oh, there is Ingrid. Ingrid raised, raised her hand. Go ahead, Ingrid. Yeah, I'm just, you know, I'm struck by this conversation at how little of this, these psychological interventions are known by practicing physicians. I mean, I think, or theories or even concepts of therapeutic alliances and stuff. I think um, if there were ways to translate some of these knowledges, knowledge across our disciplines would be extremely helpful. Cause I, you know, it, 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 this is just not something we're ever tested on. We don't learn it in medical school, at least in my training program, um, residency, even primary care focused um, programs, and uh, even maybe even addiction medicine. So, you know, I, I think it'd be, I don't know how we can translate knowledge across our fields, but that'd be something that I think would be really important to do. So I, I can speak to that a little bit, Ingrid. I mean, as probably you know, you know, I think billing is the major obstacle to all of this. You know, until, I mean, telemedicine really is a revolution because so many of these um, treatments for non-physicians that can deliver uh, many of these interventions by telemedicine. You can bill for that now. And also it's easier for in a variety of ways for physicians to bill for some of these psychosocial treatments they do as part of their care, whether you're a primary care doctor or a pain doctor or somebody else. So I think it's, it's a real opportunity to revisit all of those things in the context of telemedicine um, and be able to deliver much more of this comprehensive care. And I think that that's why you're seeing you know, we see on the ground, we don't see doctors use these things, but I think it really just comes down to billing. If you can bill for it, I think you're going to see it used, you know, which is all good, you know, because we need to do these things, you know, for our patients. I would argue, though, that we want to make sure that the training comes before the billing, because I know I've seen some um, providers oh. try something, um, and then a patient goes, oh, no, I already tried that, and like, well, not really um so we want to make sure the training comes first and then the billing uh, but otherwise i completely agree with you aj i think I, I think dissemination getting some of these materials out there making sure that um there is more either integrated care practices where there's behavioral and mental health components to it um is so so deeply important to make sure that we're treating uh patients that might be struggling with with diff the sud and and pain comorbidities uh, treat them yeah with that 360 degree concept. Yeah, and, and just one quick example, you know, was motivational interviewing. So there's actually been very good data, right, in primary care, teaching primary care doctors to use motivational interviewing for all kinds of, you know, reasons and, uh, and then being able to bill by time. Um, so that's one successful example, I think, um, to speak to your point, Ingrid. And just to amplify, I think what I heard Ingrid say a little bit too is not only sort of discrete techniques like MI or, you know, elements of CBT, but even just tweaks on the way we present things to patients. Or and I'll just give one example that I keep hearing today that um, one of my psychologist colleagues told me a few years ago, and it was like, it totally changed my 
the way that I talk to patients about new treatments, which is this, like we've been saying, this idea of treatment expectancies or kind of trying to induce a little bit of a placebo effect. Like I'm prescribing this because I really, you know, think it's going to work. And, you know, so I think even just some of those types of tweaks. Um, I agree. I don't think that that's something that I learned in my internal medicine training either and um, could be really valuable. Uh, I think Beth, you raised your hand. Yeah, I just, um, to dovetail on this point, um, I was really struck with, I think it was Ingrid's comment that, you know, it's not well integrated into um, physician consciousness, um, biopsychosocial in these treatments and, and how to provide integrated care. And um, I, w I was uh, applauding that comment because we, we do need better dissemination of information across specialties. Um, but also this training element, we, we desperately need that and we don't have time to wait. Like we, we can't be waiting for people to get up trained in these methods. And so I really think that we need to be thinking about how we can scale out access to these interve interventions to the people who need them. And so that it's not always necessarily going to be coming through the medical system, which currently stands as a formidable barrier because of what Ajay is saying with the billing. And so thinking creatively and at the institution level, can we begin thinking about funding research and projects that transcend these baked in barriers to care to provide free, accessible interventions that are going to meet the needs of a population and then dedicate our precious healthcare dollars and resources to the individuals who demonstrate a much higher need. They need that individual care, but we have to recognize that not everyone needs individual care. So this gets back to the personalized medicine comment that, that Katie made earlier as well. Katie, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure people are aware and give a plug to Kathy Carroll's work in computerized based CBT for substance use disorder. And I, I think it's a really nice model that speaks to what Beth is saying of uh, it's a clinic based computerized intervention. So it, it doesn't require additional training. Um, and, and, you know, Kathy Carroll tells the story that she de developed it because she was um, frustrated with training clinicians in CBT who were then not adherent to doing CBT. And so that's another issue with training. With respect to training in MI, um, I, I work at University of New Mexico where motivational interviewing was developed and, and I hear horror stories of these, of these clinicians who are, are, very, are not very adherent or competent in MI, uh, but are delivering it to all of their patients. And, and so I think you know, working towards more um, computerized adaptive interventions that, that have known efficacy like CBT for CBT um, is one pen potential direction and, and I would highlight that as a direction forward. This is Bob Kearns, may I jump in? Uh, just, I, just one word of caution, I'm totally on board with uh, that and, and many of you know that a lot of my work now is collaborating with others around uh, the development of technology based tools to promote access. The caveat, of course, is that there's a risk to some significant proportion of the population that we're talking about today who are vulnerable to being left behind um, with regard to uh, technology solutions. So, um, bravo for you know the move forward and it, an important um, effort around addressing social disparities and uh, uh, disadvantages in accessing these kinds of technologies, learning how to use them um, is important. And of course, you know, geography, the parts of this country that just don't have internet access. And I would echo what what Bob was saying too, because I, especially the internet component, as so many of our, our, you know, we have students and things like that that suddenly had to go uh, tele for classes and things like that. And we realized just the difference in Colorado, the difference between if you're front range or if you're back range. And this means like where the, where the Rockies divide the state. And if you're front range, sure. Yeah. Not a problem to get, to get internet. You get back range and suddenly cell phone coverage drops out, internet coverage is really spotty. Um, 
and it has caused some some real difficulties with our patient population, particularly when we're serving a deeply underserved population um, uh, with community addiction treatment, where sometimes even having the same phone number during the course of a study is not you can't assume that somebody's going to have the same phone number because they're they're on a pay as you go plans and and there's burner phones and things along the, that line that that technology is amazing and technology is wonderful and it has allowed us to do so many great things both research and clinical with this new covid thing but there is always going to be a, a section of the population that we especially underserved and especially in certain either rural communities or, or things like that that are not going to be able to access that and i don't have an easy solution to fix that, um, but just wanting to make sure that we are aware of that group as well. And they are the people that are, you know, the, these characteristics that we're talking about are characteristic of people with chronic pain, high impact chronic pain, and opioid use disorder, um, and uh, mental health disorders as well. And so I just wanted in that in that vein to um, Jessica Holsey this morning, I think started to uh, really address this in in folks with addiction and the and the COVID impact. And I just wondered if she had more to say about the challenges of trying to do as much through telehealth um, for the the folks that she's in in touch with and and some thoughts about this. Um. So we are providing Dr. Carroll's CBT for CBT and the HS platform, um, which is called Connections app to our whole community, particularly during the pandemic. Um, we have had um, reports that particularly our, our homeless population does not have smartphone um, access. Um, and it, it's been a hard go for them, particularly loss of panhandling income has sort of caused um, sort of withdrawal, forced withdrawal, um, and, and a, a lot of uh, sort of real crisis situations. But in general, we have 2,500 patients that we have brought on to the HS platform, which provides the CBT for CBT. It has pathways for SUD, AUD, and um, individuals um, on buprenorphine, so um, it can be specialized. It, uh, so I, I think surprisingly, um, we have a lot of folks that do have smartphone access, um, even among our active use disorder population. There are some, though, that we are going to miss in building a safety net if we only have internet-based and smartphone tools, and some might be our very most vulnerable. Uh, so I think while we're expanding telehealth and um, digital therapeutics, we still need to be thinking about how we engage those that are really in trouble and don't have the resources for those, um, uh, whether it's a computer or internet access or a smartphone. Um, so I, I think we kind of need to dual track this. It is really helpful. You'll be surprised by how many people do have a smartphone. And when it comes down to prioritizing what bills are going to pay, be paid, um, particularly our, our um, young adult population is going to make sure that their iPhone stays on. However, um, we have a, a little bit more um, older and in crisis population that do not have access to, uh, to internet or smartphones. Okay, I will take the last question before I turn it over to Lynn to wrap up. And I think it's from Eric, you have your uh, hand raised. Yeah, and this is just a comment, which, which is that here, I wonder if uh, the again, the VA model of the community-based outpatient clinic might serve us with a telehealth option so people who don't have access to internet at, in their homes could go to their local their local, local clinic. And if there's no clinician there who is trained in these modalities to treat comorbid pain and OUD, then you could pipe in somebody who is through telehealth. And that's one of the things that's been very eye-opening to me is I, I realized that you know, I, I could, for example, I could train a clinician here in Salt Lake City to deliver my intervention, and they could be delivering that intervention to anybody in the country, anywhere from their house in Salt Lake City. So I think it really does open up a lot of possibilities in terms of getting well-trained uh, practitioners to reach people in need. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you all for your outstanding discussion. I guess now, is it Lynn? Yeah. Yeah. Okay.
Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just have a few comments. I know this has been uh, a long day, so we don't want to keep people a long time, but this has been just a tremendous, um, tremendous discussion, and I've been really impressed with trying to do this all virtually, um, how much cross-dialogue uh, we've been able to have, and just really want to commend um, NIH for uh, uh, listening to some of the discussion, as Chris Beasley had said in the GIT working group, where we really said these things are too siloed, we really want to and need to have this discussion, and not only talking about opioid use disorder and pain, but obviously touching on a number of comorbidities, as well as I would say a, a, a number of you know, really uh, types of science and, and different things we need to bring to the fore to really look at this. So go ahead and, and go one slide forward if you could. So just in preparation for tomorrow, um, I only have two slides and the second one is just a reminder of the questions that are being posed in our breakout groups and, and really the goals at the end of the day. Um, clearly we did, we went through very quickly this morning uh, the really laying the, the, the frame and foundation um, without as much time for discussion as I know folks would have liked, but the very provocative discussions and we will be taking all of those questions uh, and, and comments that people submitted and putting those back out uh, as well. So you'll have that repository. We dr drilled for this afternoon and that really represents out tomorrow. Um, obviously people have expertise across all of these domains. So if you're in one versus another, I would urge you maybe to reach out to the, uh, to the, the facilitator of that if you have particular things you'd like to um, to have be part of that discussion, although we will come back together. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to say a little bit in terms of, of maybe some ways to think broadly about you know, some of these things. And, and a lot of this we've touched on. Um, I'm impressed with this group that there are people that have really worked very as well as broadly across a number of these domains. And we, we certainly have often different um, methods and approaches and tools that we use uh, when we're doing work in addiction or chronic pain or more broadly in mental health, um, as, as well as, as some of the culture and, and clinical care that happens in those areas. And to really think about how we can, uh, we can work at those interfaces and use those tools in ways that really enhance creativity, um, I, was, I was struck uh, by Mark Ilgen's comments earlier today, and, and this, I think, interweaves uh, nicely in some ways with stigma, um, and, and that is an inner, uh, you know, a, a theme that really interweaves across these areas. But in saying that um, in addictions, um, it, it's more the medications and adherence to the medications that we know to be really critically important, um, at least in the short run, that patients really want the non-pharmacotherapy treatment and that we have something that's almost the reverse in pain. And I would, I would wonder if some of that has to do with stigma and maybe having those broader discussions about benefits and risks. Um, you know, we, we talked about how uh, providers are talking more about risks and that's in, in the frame and patients with benefits. So how do we bring some of these, what we know about stigma into how we, we, we really introduce some of these treatments? Um, we, we've talked quite a lot today about implementation and its challenges, and I think ended on a note of saying, uh, and particularly when I was looking in the chat, that, that some of what COVID has pushed us to in terms of telehealth have, have resulted in the short run to more flexibility in how we can, we can deliver care, and in some instances, more adherence. So how can we think about um, especially when we're looking at a five year, uh, really, you know, pretty getting at these things in short order. How can we be pragmatic about the, the, the clinical tools and systems that we're working in and, and devise uh, uh, studies that, that, that can work in uh, using those kind of tools? And what can we learn from patients who have maybe on their own effectively navigated things and things like the whole health program in the VA that was, that was mentioned? And then finally, also to note that there was really a nice uh, cross-section of talking about some of the important basic science findings and, and many of you who are working in those domains as well as, as the clinical studies 
Um, I think Beth and others highlighted that to do these multimorbidity studies and to do them in pragmatic ways really are, are their ambitious undertakings, but can we enfold some of the really important um, mechanistic work and some of the things that would allow us to, to, to really um, use those in broader ways? And so as you're thinking about the discussions tomorrow, I would just encourage people to bring those uh, into the fore. And then the last slide I had was just a reminder um, for day two of just what those, you can change it, yeah. What, what the questions are that are undergirding those breakout sessions and then um, that we will be coming back together to talk about how these, where the overall gaps and synergies are across these three breakouts and I think bringing in things from the discussion today uh, to really try to, to distill in what are those those, those top research and infrastructure needs that will really um, help to inform our NIH colleagues about how we, we uh, there may be programs or, or, or calls for applications that can, can really get at this very rich and important domain. And I'll stop there and maybe turn it back to Leslie or if there are any other um, logistics for tomorrow. Thanks, Lynn. And um, Dave, while you're bringing up my slide, um, I just want to echo Lynn's um, comments and it was a terrific discussion today and thank you all so much and, and for staying engaged throughout this uh, long day virtually. Um, and just also to reiterate um, a little bit of what Lynn said, one is that we you will be receiving from um, Susan Holbrook, who is our um, part of the contract support, the draft notes from um, day today, as well as um, the chat. So the different items that were um, available through chat, what you will receive by uh, 7 p.m. Eastern time today. And that's really to get you thinking about what were some of those key um, items uh, that we want to really hone in on in the individual breakouts that you're going to be in tomorrow. Um, and again, um, we recognize that you have broader expertise than perhaps just the one breakout you are being put in. Um, so do know that we come back together for a general discussion so that you can still help to inform um, where you think it's important. Um, but again, as Lynn said, feel free to reach out to folks in advance as well. Okay, we will um, reconvene tomorrow at 10 a.m. Eastern time as we did today. And um, one thing we're asking is that you please sign in with your first and last name. And this is just to facilitate the movement to the breakouts, make it a lot easier um, for our technical support. So with that, I would um, really like to thank you and I hope you have a very nice rest of the evening. Thanks. Thank you. See you tomorrow.